I'd like to welcome my colleague Benjamin Schiller from the Dieter Schwarz Foundation and Pete van der Zanden, education expert for audiovisual information technology in learning spaces at the Technical University of Delft. My name is Lara Kolbert. I'm program manager at the Stifterverband for the funding initiative Learning Architectures, a cooperation of the Stifterverband and the Dieter Schwarz Foundation. Today, Benjamin and I will give you a brief insight in our funding initiative. And afterwards, Pete will show you how future-oriented learning spaces look like at the Technical University Delft and how they have shaped the process of developing these learning spaces. So, talking about space, I'd like to invite you to imagine you're going to a church. How will you behave when you enter the building? And now imagine you're going to university. How will you behave when you enter the lecture hall or when you enter the cafeteria? Learning spaces are not just about walls and architecture. They're about the environment, about the objects like furniture and most important they are about the activity of the people using the space so how do users interact with each other with whom are they interacting and that leads us to the questions <coughs> why do we need new learning spaces today the environment is changing we are facing large sustainable challenges it's an open dynamic how society and economy is changing. And people already use the term VUCA world to sum up the volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity of today's world. It's not longer a question that today's students need skills and abilities that go beyond knowledge and empower them for the 21st century challenges. That's why we should ask ourselves why do we still teach like this when we already know that learning is like this and especially competent, competence-based learning? So why do so many learning spaces still look like lecture halls or seminar rooms? And how can they look instead? How can we use technology and digital space for learning? So learning space design is the design of possibilities for learners and teachers to create their best learning experience to gain 21st century skills, including knowledge, soft skills like communication and collaboration, digital skills, data literacy, and entrepreneurial skills. With the funding initiative Learning Architectures, the Stifterverband and the Dieter Schwarz Foundation want to support higher educational institutions to implement future-oriented learning spaces. And on the one hand, the initiative includes hands-on projects. On the other hand, networking and higher educational policy recommendations. So in the normal case, new buildings are designed by architects and planners who have never been active in the field of teaching or learning themselves. To enable user-centered room design that fits the needs and wishes of the learners and the academics, now and also in the future, we initiate co-creation processes involving students, teachers, planners and architects. With the creative workshop format space for learning, we are addressing so the so-called working phase zero and offer universities a framework to establish user-centered learning space design. We are cooperating with the construction companies, like for example, the Bau- and Liegenschaftsbetrieb, NRW, to accompany the further working phases of construction projects in order to draw conclusions about challenges and moments of success. And to get a better understanding of the challenges that higher education institutions are facing in these processes, we create communities of practice. 
We build bridges between the different institutions with similar challenges and support them to develop solutions together, supported by experts in the field. Challenges can be questions like, how can, I ex how can external funds be acquired for financing? Or how can the impact of future-oriented learning spaces can be measured? And regarding to the last question, the impact measurement. We support higher education institutions to implement space labs on their campus. The spaces enable an experimental approach to the development of new learning architectures. So teachers and learners become researchers and explorers at the same time. With this program, pro with this program, we want to support the redesign of already existing room structures. And now I'd like to hand over the, the word to Benjamin. So thank you, Lara. And also a welcome to the audience from my side. So the other three modules of the funding initiative entail networking activities, which means linking the and connecting the community concerning the innovative learning spaces um, supported by a, a common platform online and sharing lot knowledge within this platform. So then, of course, it's about collecting next practices in that field, as you will hear from Pete later on, and uh, feeding these next practices back into the network in order to make an impact to change the perspective or change the attitude towards building new learning spaces at universities. And then the next. So the next slide is about the policy impact. So feeding back all the gained knowledge to the policy debate in higher education, which is especially important in Germany. Um, linking and connecting with uh, players such as the Wissenschaftsrat, the German Science Council, or the uh, projects such as the um, Lernwelten Hochschule from the Stuttgart Media University, and feeding it back to the policy debate, because in Germany, higher education is still a state matter. And to be more precise, it's a matter of 16 different federal states with different legislation frameworks, which also have an impact on how to create universities. And on the long run, we hope and intend to have an impact on that to make a change of the perspective and the attitude towards creating university spaces and learning spaces for 21st century learning. So that's it's so far from our side. So I will hand over to Lara. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yesterday I visited the campus of the Technical University in Delft and I'm really inspired by the diversity of learning spaces at the campus. So I'd love to turn the floor over to Pete so he can tell us a little bit about how they develop these spaces. Pete, the stage is yours. Thank you, Lara. For this introduction, nice introduction, I want to tell uh, something about our experiences from the last two decades uh, in working together with several departments and uh, uh, most of all with teachers and students to come to new education spaces. Uh, and first, I must say uh, we are always talking about future learning spaces, but yeah, what is the future? Uh, one university is a step ahead and another one is a step behind. And uh, from what situation? are you leaving today? So future, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, new skills, of course, and education is, of, is certainly changing uh, with collaborative and cooperative skills coming in and uh, where the uh, learning spaces and teaching spaces must be adapted to these new ways. Uh, I want to uh, give you a very fast ride uh, to things that we come uh, and see every day as discussion points together with uh, the AV integrators, with the architects and, and the constructioners. 
and most of all it's about uh, readability uh, I leave my presentation behind in the end are uh, some bookmarks so if you want to look something back uh, you are able after this uh, presentation so I just start and uh, I always uh, start with this first question, uh, do we need power sockets in class? For us, it's already uh, long gone, but I have seen many uh, campuses where power sockets are still uh, not uh, correctly installed. Uh, but we have passed these discussions and this is a more, there is some delay. Okay, this is a more, interesting thing can you read the subject matter as a student from every place in the classroom and lecture hall and uh, without uh, concentrating without a headache and uh, think about it so uh, what we think is rather normal that readability is done and uh, designed from the beginning uh, uh, from the drawing table but it's not true uh, uh, but what you expect and what you think you get is the same as you're going to an optician. Uh, if you need 100% uh, visual acuity, you get a best glasses that fits to that situation. And why is that not the same in the classroom or the lecture halls? So we did a lot of exper uh, experiments uh, and measurements in classrooms and it's especially about character recognition uh, if you have the first year students who want to uh, discern all those greek characters in those strange formulas they really need to uh, be able to read them uh, correctly and not peering uh, but it's not about only the, uh, the the readability the the height of the characters it's also about the place where you sit uh, because of the vertical sidelines here are in the first row the screen in this in the place must not to be high uh, everybody uh, is has been to a cinema if you sit on the first row then you have about the same experiences as it because your skull cannot tilt more than 25 degrees and your eyes only uh, a few uh, degrees further and the 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 uh, spot in your eyes that recognizes characters is just like a letterbox so you need to uh, uh, tilt your head to follow text and other uh, different formulas that are presented on the screen and the same count for uh, the horizontal sidelines where you have the strains in your neck uh, over 35 degrees you cannot go further that's why we always say in flat level classroom use uh, chairs on wheels so you can really turn easily or if you have lecture halls do a radius in your uh, in your row so that you don't have to turn too much next to that we have done uh, okay we do it for our audience the the youngsters between 20 and 30 years of age and the eye height is certainly uh, interesting because of the the what we call baseline so the the floor the the underside of the screen must mean not be too low uh, other things are about construction things uh, that are uh, really necessary for building you don't want to have them in the way and what we see especially with the light planners that uh, they really work hard to have a, a, a good lightning everywhere in the classroom but do not mind the uh, presentation screen and uh, especially this one we were surprised many times uh, by the sun in the early spring and late autumn uh, when the beams come in and we didn't calculate and didn't have uh, foreseen those nasty beams that you you cannot read the screen after it okay we are talking about acoustics and the climate of course and all those things if they count up they come to what we call the image quality can you read what is presented and there are some nice tools to uh, to measure them and what we mostly use is the pisco uh, uh, standard is the projected image system contrast ratio and to give you a very small example of my own hernia at the left side you see a contrast ratio of 8.2 i want to uh, 
show and and you see a, a, a nice white spot in the back of uh, the lower back of me but at the right side it's totally gone so if you have some pictures with details in the classroom and your contrast ratio is not correct then you lose some of your quality uh, next to that uh, new practices are coming in and the most uh, uh, of the current situations the current um, classrooms are based on the earlier uh, insulation rates of 20 to 45 degrees per wall but today you have a voice amplification next to multimedia tools uh, if you have presentation there is a lot of sound and uh, be aware that the adjacent room does not have uh, that sound coming in uh, and more of that the new uh, practices students talk together have discussions and then a cacophony of an extra 10 db is coming in and you have you hear that in the adjacent rooms too so please be aware of such uh, uh, nasty sounds that are not calculated with in the older and the conventional buildings uh, what i want to say is just uh, done by winston churchill we shape our buildings and after that we have to fit in and do it with the, the things that we have at that moment, the affordances and nudges that are, there are available, but without those proper affordances, the teachers are not able to change the practices, so they must be there. Okay. Then comes the question, we have a current situation with a lot of, uh, let's say, conventional lecture halls, and some of them we want to change into new spaces or future based spaces how you call it um, first you have to know what is going on today and that's what we did a few years ago uh, what we see we have a lot of chalkboards still for scientific explanations formula writing etc and we are transforming that to digital writing once in the digital form uh, we can do much more with it and we can close the gap to let's say the online or the hybrid situations and next accounted for dual signal systems where you have uh, smaller and larger rooms of course uh, the new furniture who's coming in mixed practices it's not only uh, here in college or Hörsaal, it's also uh, practicing together uh, doing assignments with students and depends on uh, of course on, on on the educational track that they follow but there are many different things to to design for. Uh, we also have from paper exams to digital exams and uh, directly I say, okay, these are the old fashioned ways to get our diplomas from the government and collect our money as a university. But of course, these new practices where uh, students have to learn cooperative skills, collaborative skills, uh, then you need to think about problem solving and uh, collaborative design uh, engineering uh, situations. I'm waiting for my slide. This comes in. I have a few pictures of our practices that we have. It's not just a meeting, it's more dynamic, it's working together. And I have a few pictures. This was an old slide, but hybrid practices before the corona uh, came in, and uh, especially uh, the Leuven, KU Leuven, the University of Leuven. Uh, does extremely good work, extremely good research, how didactical and retention uh, come together in these new spaces. Uh, we also have a, a collaborative design lab, but we started uh, right at the beginning of the corona uh, period, so we do not have empirical data at the moment. I'm waiting for the slides, okay. Um, most uh, what students learn is to work together on ill-structured problems uh, to have to give them an assignment work this uh, work this out and you don't have any guidelines but uh, in the first year you had your practices you have your technologies you have your methods and share them and work together and come out with this uh, uh, beautiful results that was the challenge for us and at our situation uh, we had many how, how am I doing with the time? Uh, <laughs> in our situation, we have a lot of general lecture halls and classrooms, and they were under the maintenance of uh, the faculties. 
And this was two decades ago where the faculty were in charge. And what was most important for, for a faculty that was research, of course, because uh, that's where you live on and not uh, about education. And now two decades uh, further, we really have focus on education and valorization too. Valorization is, is bringing your research results to the uh, uh, society. Uh, we have a double size of students, so we could not fit the students in their own faculties anymore. They had to change and, and reshadowed over campus. Um, and then all, uh, one important thing is that we build new education buildings now monofunctionally just for education. And so our architecture and our uh, classroom and space design can be uh, especially for education practice and not be disturbed, as I may so, by office or research uh, 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 guidelines and demands. Uh, we got uh, uh, this, this assignment as several departments of the university, so real estate, education, uh, ICT and facilities had to work together, think about what is our legacy on classrooms and uh, update them to the standards of today. And we had to work together. It was quite a challenge, I must say. But uh, what we, we have one key success factor, and this is what I call the governance structure, work together and learn each other's ontologies, each other's uh, definitions. What do you mean by, uh, and how can we speak and work as one from university staff to outside staff? So if we do an assignment of a commission to a, an architect, then we speak as one because we want we know what we want and we do it from the very start today instead of being last in a row as education what normally was uh, of course uh, identical operation if you have students or uh, uh, teachers uh, going from one building to another building they just uh, must be able to operate the situation the, the the installation and not uh, having different uh, things uh, the second uh, key success factor that we had is that we have written it all down in what we call a cookbook education spaces. And it was uh, such a book with so many things in it. So we did a lot of work to peel it off, to come to the core and only have a very small, tiny book. And you can download it. Uh, I have a bookmark at the end, in the last slide uh, that you can, uh, if you see it, you think, uh, is that all? Uh, yes. Uh, at the moment, that is all, but it's only the, the top of the mountain. The rest is underwater, and it's, uh, it comes uh, with it, I, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> OK, what is in the cookbook? We have four parts. Uh, we did a classification uh, at that time together with the teachers and students and, uh, and teaching staff and, uh, and supporting staff. And at that time, we had four practices. It is frontal. Uh, the Hörsale, the mixed uh, colleges, uh, really collaborating where students work together with or, uh, or without coaches uh, uh, and testing, of course, because of the diplomas. Uh, we already had some ideas about hybrid and collaborative design labs, but that is not in there yet. And we believe it will be in uh, by the end of 2022 because we do not have enough uh, uh, data, empirical data at, as yet. Uh, in part uh, B, it's about the space topologies. What sort of classrooms do you have? Part C is the most technical one, the requirements about the readability, the acoustics, uh, etc. And part D is about the informal study places because next to all your uh, learning, uh, teaching and learning spaces, you have these informal spaces on campus too, where they can work together and work on with it. Okay, what, what did we see in the cookbook? Because it has uh, a lot of uh, uh, tables and figures in. Uh, so we have uh, visualized this cookbook in an application. And this application, I'm sorry to say, it's not free yet. It's only on the license. But we can simulate all those things. If we have time, I can do a very small. Uh, no, I don't have time. Uh, we also have a, a dashboard with, uh, especially for the executive ones uh, who want to see what do we have in stock uh, from our spaces and uh, what we want to say. And what we have learned is uh, be at the right beginning from when a new building or refurbishment take place because uh, 
the programmable requirements are so important from the start on. Everybody makes programs of requirement, but what lacks are the readability about uh, uh, are the, 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 the special things related to education. You don't see them normally within this uh, space of in the program of requirements. And what you see is that because you have defined it in the beginning, it saves lots of time and money. Uh, and of course, it can be checked easily. So uh, these are very important things that you think right at the beginning and set your, uh, your, your specific requirements based on the education practice that you want to have in them. So these future practices, uh, you must uh, define them today because before you have a new building, uh, it, it takes time. It is at least uh, three to seven years of building time. So uh, the future of today is already uh, old uh, when you have your new building. Uh, the last slide, and it's where I want to stop, uh, is where you find some bookmarks. And I could demonstrate a few of those things, but you can find it out yourself. Uh, this is where I want to stop my spray of information. <laughs> Pete, thank you very much. I think the last one, Pulse Education Building Virtual Tour, it's also the possibility for everyone um, to have an own look how everything you just mentioned will feel like if it is implemented in a real physical space. So I would recommend it after my tour yesterday to every one of you to have a look to this one. <laughs> And now there's a question. Um, From the audience, um, Carson Lensing is asking, what do you say to the argument that teacher must be able, competent, in order to teach well in a learning space, space which fits to him or her? Can't we replace univers university teachers with new compatible ones at intervals, like faster than new buildings? I think it's about how can we change rooms in intervals so we don't build new buildings but we re redesign the places we already have I, i'm uh, i do not see this question but what do you There is much more possible today if you think we have a situation, our classroom is uh, rather old and the building we cannot do anything about because of the regulations from the government, it's a monument, etc. But still, uh, if you think about a, a, a lecture hall where you have one row per level, uh, make two rows per level and make them interactive and make them turn so you can really uh, do a lot of things uh, and at the moment i know that the eth of zurich is really working out uh, these new spaces or let's say alternative spaces for the current ones there are so many possibilities but sometimes you really have to see let's say examples from other sites yes thank you very much there's another comment in the chat And someone said, please give an advice for our German government to be installed to invest in teaching flexibility instead of forcing us to more and more KPI numbers to get financed or not financed. Um, the voice of an innovative university like the Technical University in Delft would be really great in this. I think we're taking this information and trying to keep this so that you will be a voice for us and a good example how we can do better in Germany. If there are any other questions in the chat or of the audience, please write now in the chat. We still have one minute left. Otherwise, I would like to recommend to you our workshop tomorrow because if you would like to dive deeper in the field of learning spaces by yourself then there's the vision workshop um, designing learning spaces of the future tomorrow with anna 
Pre and Mi, and you can have the opportunity to design your own learning spaces. I'll be happy to see you there. And now I thank you, Pete, very much for all the interesting research and insights you shared with us. Thank you, Benjamin, for being here and also everyone who is listening. Thank you very much and have a good day at University Future Festival and the following program so, programs. <laughs> yeah. Thank you from my side. Thanks thank for you. listening and thanks for having us here. Thank you and good luck and have an inspiring uh, conference. Thank you very much. You are muted. Is it now working? Thanks. Uh, thanks again for your um, introduction, uh, for your for your presentation. There's one question in the chat about um, sharing the slides. Um, it's possible to get the slides. Someone asking if you, you can yes. um, put your slides into the shared files. Um, folder and the audience can download it from there but I see a lot of people are already leaving but it's a nice function bro